Daniel chapter nine, Daniel chapter nine, go with us there to Daniel chapter nine. Last week we covered, uh, we covered the first half of, uh, this particular chapter and dealt with Daniel's prayer. In the first point, we're going to, we're going to kind of review just a smidgen on that. I'm not going to review in as great detail as we went through last week because we're going to run out of time. Uh, but we, we saw Daniel's prayer. Daniel had been reading the word and by reading the word, he found out some stuff from the Lord and that was going to be the return of the people from captivity. How many of y'all know when you read the Bible, it'll affect the way you pray. Amen. Amen. And so he, he began to pray and, and we'll get into that, but let's just jump right in here. The Bible says in verse 20, that's where we stopped. We stopped at verse 19 uh, last week. So let's jump in there to verse number 20. Is everybody at Daniel 9, verse 20? Everybody good. All right. Uh, and by the way, this is a great crowd for a rainy Wednesday night. Can we give God praise and glory right there? I'm, 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 I'm going to be mean every week now. Somebody, somebody said I was mean last Sunday. Oh, mercy. We all need our toes stepped on every now and then. Amen. Well, anyway, I do. I do. All right. Daniel chapter nine. And I'm, I'm just kidding, guys. I'm just kidding. You guys are faithful every Wednesday. It's a good crowd on Wednesday night, especially in the rain. It's funny how the devil will try to discourage you. And, and every time I, I'm in, I'm in my office all day. All, I never leave my office on Wednesday uh, from the beginning to the end, they bring my lunch into me. I never leave. I'm focused on the Bible study for Wednesday night. And every time I'd hear, I'd hear that deluge on the top of the roof. And every time the devil said, they ain't going to be there. They ain't going to show up. You're in a Baptist church. You see all that rain out there and pff, on the devil tonight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm so glad y'all made a liar out of the devil. And you really didn't have to make a liar out of the devil because he's already a liar. He's the father of all lies. Amen. Verse number 20. We're running rabbits. Get back to verse 20. Are y'all in verse 20? Say amen. amen. While I was speaking and praying, this is Daniel. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and so two things he's doing in this prayer. He's confessing sin and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, this is the angel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding at the beginning of the supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined. Now, you know, this is bad enough when you got to study the Bible, but when they go to throwing math in the deal. Yeah. Amen. I'm sorry. I just had to vent a little bit. I told them all in the hallway this, this morning, I said, be quiet. I've got to do math too tonight. Amen. <laughs> Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score, score is 20. So three score is 60 and two weeks, 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince shall come or excuse me, and the people of the prince that shall come uh, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood under the end of the war. Desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. 
even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful and thankful for, for your word. And Lord, I'm thankful that you've put it in a way that we can understand it. Thank you for the, 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 the lesson tonight. Uh, Lord, help me to, to get out what all you put in me. Help me to deliver it in a way that the youngest person, the most inexperienced person, Lord, even a lost person can be able to understand what your word is saying. I pray in Jesus name that you'll touch us all. Thank, thank you for allowing them to be here. Lord, this is a great crowd and I, I pray that you'll give them double blessing tonight for coming out in the rain and being faithful and committed. I pray in Jesus name that you'll touch your word. Let it edify us, strengthen us, build us up. I encourage us, Lord, encourage us to go on and fight the battle. I pray in Jesus' name. Don't let me say anything I shouldn't. And don't let me forget anything I should. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Control every word, every thought. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Go back to verse number 20. We'll jump right in there and start there. Verse number 20. First of all, if you're writing notes, write this down. First of all, we see the prayer, the prayer. Basically, basically that's, we studied that completely last week and, and that was all we covered was the prayer of Daniel after he read the Bible, after he read the word, uh, he, was, he was reading Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet told and said and proclaimed that after 70 years, that Israel would be able to go back home. After 70 years, 70 years would be the, the duration of their captivity in Babylon. And after that, they would be able to go back home. The time is almost up. Uh, uh, it, it, Daniel realizes that the time is near and he begins to wonder and he begins to worry and he begins to think about his people, his people, Israel, the nation of Israel. Now, keep in mind, everybody look at me before you start writing something. I need you to get this. This is so important uh, because people get Bible prophecy all mixed up and all messed up and in different things that God says when they apply it to the wrong group. There are times in God's word when he's speaking to Israel. OK, there are times in God's word when he's speaking to Israel. There are times in God's word when he's speaking to Gentiles. Okay. So there's times in God's word when he's speaking to Gentiles. Gentiles. But then there are times in God's word when he's speaking to the church, the church. And that is found in the new Testament. Okay. We have, we have seen earlier in the book of Daniel that, that God explained, and, and we said this, we already said this back Back in the, the, the past chapters, it was written in Arabic because the primary, the primary lessons, the primary teaching had to do with the times of the Gentiles. Are y'all with me? Everything about the Gentiles, the Gentile rule on this earth. But now it's changed. It's changed back to uh, we're, we're seeing now he's writing it in Hebrew because right now it's Jewish territory we are in. And what we are fixing to read and what we are fixing to study has to do with the Jewish people, the Jewish temple and the Jewish city, Jerusalem. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. So don't get things mixed up. I, I've, I've seen people uh, uh, with well-meaning intention post promises that God gave to the nation of Israel and they claimed it for themselves. Well, that's that's a mistake. You cannot do that. Listen, a promise to Israel is not to the church and a, a promise to the church is not to Israel. They're two different things. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. But what we are reading and what we are describing and what we're talking about, and I know you think, well, it's not that big a deal. It will be a big deal when we get to that last point and you'll see why. Okay. So the primary, the primary target, the primary group, the primary audience and congregation is who? Israel. Israel. Say that with me. Is Israel. Israel. Okay. Now, number one, we see the prayer, the prayer. Look in verse number 20. When you're there, say amen. amen. And while I was speaking and praying. praying, two things, or actually three things here I want you to write down. First of all, in his prayer, there's a whole lot of repenting. There's a whole lot of repenting. 
This is verses three through 15. I'm not going to cover if you if you missed last week, go back and, and look at the archives and, and, and listen to the whole message last week. There's one thing we need to learn when we go to God, we need to go clean. There's a reason that that Jesus said in the prayer, you remember the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray, teach us how to pray. And in that prayer, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us, right? Forgive us our sins. There's a pardon. We need to come to God for cleansing. We need to come to God and, and ask God to forgive us of anything that would hinder him from moving. And boy, Daniel, he was repenting. He was confessing the sins of Israel. He was confessing his personal sins. Not just, look what he says, not just my sins, but my people's sins. The sins, the national sins of Israel, the national rebellion and all of the iniquity that they had gathered up because that is why they were in captivity. That is why 490 years worth of Sabbaths not being kept for the land kept them in captivity for 70 years. So in the, in the prayer, we find repenting. All right. Then we see that in verse 20, right? He says, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel. There you go. Come on. All right. And you can see the detail. Now, I didn't put this beside the notes. I put the verses three through 15 so you could go back and look in detail how he repented and how how uh, clear he, he was in describing his repentance. But then B, there's the requesting. There's the requesting. Look in verse 20. Look in verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, that's repentance, confessing my sin and the sin of my people. Now watch this. And that means he's doing something different now. And presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. So first he's repenting of their past sin and he's making now requests for Israel. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now let's go back. Let's go back to verse 16. Because if you go back to verse 16, you'll find out what the supplications were. What were the prayers what were the prayers that Daniel was asking for the nation of Israel? Verse 16. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city. What? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Thy holy mountain, because for our sins and our iniquities, our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, our God, Hear the prayer of thy servant in his what? Supplication. Supplication. So first he's praying for the city. God, turn your anger away from the city. Cause thy face to shine upon thy... That's the temple. That's the temple. He's saying, Lord, show your presence in the temple. Lord, what about the temple? What about the temple? Keep in mind that temple's destroyed. That temple's destroyed at this writing. There is no temple. But he's wanting to know, what about the city? What's, what's going to be in the future? What, what about the temple in the future? Okay, verse, verse 17, excuse me, verse 18. Oh my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations. Desolation, everybody knows what desolate means. It means waste. It means there's nothing there. It means totally destroyed. You see our desolation. The sanctuary is desolate. And by the way, by the way, uh, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, let's continue. For we do, excuse me, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness. Nothing. In other words, we're not bringing this to you because we've earned it, but simply because you are very merciful. But for thy great mercies. Now watch here. Here we go. Here we go. Y'all ready? O Lord, hear, O Lord. Come on. O Lord, hear, O Lord. Forgive, O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not. For thine own sake, oh my God, for thy city, thy people are called by thy name. So his request is centered around three things. The temple, the city, and the people. Now, the temple of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and the people. All of it is the nation of Israel. All of it is Jewish. Are y'all with me? He's saying, what's going to happen to our people? All right, we're going to get to go back, sure. But what about the future? 
Now he's saying, why are you saying all this? Because what we're fixing to read in the prophecy we're fixing to read about the 70 weeks is God's answer to that supplication. What is going to be the future of the nation of Israel? Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. All right. C. What was A? Come on, everybody. A. Repenting. Repenting. B. Requesting. C. Look at the response. Look at the response. Verses 21 through 23. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, remember this is in chapter eight, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Let me say something about that real quick. <clears throat> he touched me about the time of the evening oblation. You say, what is that? That was the time that they would offer sacrifices back in Israel when the temple was still there. Preacher, what are you saying? Everything was gauged on what they did in Israel. That's how they kept dates. That's how they kept time. That's how they kept everything. So what's the point? The point is Daniel's body may have been in Babylon, but his heart was in Jerusalem. His, his body was in a foreign land. His body was in a pagan society, but his heart was still at home. He still prayed like he prayed in Jerusalem. He still prayed and sought God like he did in God's promised land. Somebody say amen. amen. No matter where you are, you can find God. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where this culture goes. We can still in our heart go to where, say amen. amen. Yes, yes. Listen, listen. And because of that, God sent his angel, the messenger angel, Gabriel. And he informed me, verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and what? Understanding. understanding. In other words, God wants us to understand this. God's not wanting us to be confused. God wants us to understand this. At the beginning of thy supplications... In other words, when you first started praying, the, the, the command came forward. God commanded me to come explain and help you understand this. I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Okay, so we see the response. God responded. God is answering the prayer of his prophet Daniel. How many of y'all are glad God hears you when you pray? Now, listen, we're going to learn, we're going to learn, not yet, but in Daniel, that there was times Daniel prayed that his answer was delayed. It was delayed. And the reason I'm telling you this now is don't get discouraged. If you're praying and it feels like nobody's listening, delay does not mean denial. It just means it's delayed. You just keep praying. Amen. Amen. So, so secondly, number two, we see the prayer. So is everybody with me on this now? He read the Bible. He read Jeremiah. He learns about uh, that Israel is going to be able to go back. The 70 years is almost up. <clears throat> and now he's concerned about the people. He's concerned about the city. He's concerned about the temple. What about the future? So God hears this and now he's sending the answer to this prayer. He's sending the answer to Daniel's concern. So number two, we see the prophecy. Write that down. We see the prayer and then we see the prophecy. Very simple, very simple. The Bible says in verse number 24, verse number 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy and upon thy to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So three, three things I want to give you underneath the prophecy. First of all, the people, write that down. The people, who does this, who does this involve? Who does this include? It's the nation of Israel. Everything about this is the nation of Israel. Okay. Everything about these verses is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel's people, the nation of Israel's temple, the nation of Israel's city. Specifically, the city of God, Jerusalem. All right. It says upon thy people and thy holy city. Who, what is the holy city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. OK, now B. write this down. The purpose, the purpose, God's purpose for. This 70 weeks. 
this prophetic timetable. He gives six different things. He gives six different things that he's going to do in this time period. All right. The word, the word determined. 70 weeks are determined. The word means to cut out, to cut out. In other words, God has cut out of the timeline of humanity, this section of time specifically for Israel. Y'all a little slow tonight. Come on. He's cut it out. He's designed it specifically, planned it, purposed it for his people, for the holy city, for the temple. Okay. Now, here's the thing. What's he going to do? Six different things. Three of them have to do with sin and three of them have to do with righteousness. Let's look at it. Verse number 24. He said, I've cut this time out. I've designated this time in the history of humanity that has to do with the, the nation of Israel and the holy city to do these six things, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting what? Righteousness. Righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. In those 70 weeks, those things are going to get accomplished. That is the purpose that God has for his people. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now, I gave you some information. I gave you some information there underneath your notes about those six things. Now, I'm going to kind of, I've, 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 I've written out some different notes that, that, that go with this. This is, the, this is the cliff notes. What you got in yours is a cliff notes. I'm going to go into a little more detail, okay? So uh, just kind of watch me for just a second. Just listen. We're, we're going to describe those six things that's going to take place. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. So you can rest your pen and just look at me, all right? You got the stuff in the cliff notes version. I'm just going to go in a little more detail about those six things. Everybody with me, say amen. amen. If you're with me out there, if ever you say amen. Good job. All right. Boy, I hope they're out there. Amen. <laughs> I know y'all are out there. I know y'all are out there. Amen. Here we go. Here we go. All right. First of all, first of all, to finish the transgression, the transgression. This is so good. The word transgression carries with it the idea of rejection and apostasy, rejection and apostasy. The transgression referred to here in this chapter refers to a national rejection, not an individual rejection, but a national rejection. He came unto his own and his own. The nation rejected Jesus. Yes, some believe. Yes, some Jews uh, accepted him and believed, but not the nation. And by the way, the nation is still rejecting him. All right. Now. It's a national rejection. The Jews rejection of their savior. Now here's the thing. The central theme to Daniel's prayer was the transgression of his people, right? The people's transgressions would culminate into the transgression. Now they sinned, they sinned and rebelled and were wicked throughout the period of time, but it built up and culminated into the Rejection of rejections when they rejected Christ, their Messiah. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Today, Israel continues to reject the Lord Jesus as Messiah. But watch this. At the end of the 70th week, they will recognize him as their Messiah. And that is when they will say in Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, here's what they're going to say. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we, the nation of Israel, we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we, the nation of Israel, esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our, the nation of Israel, our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we, the nation of Israel, did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. What are you saying? The main part of the nation of Israel looked at him as a wicked sinner who God was punishing because he was being crucified. Are y'all with me? 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we, the nation of Israel, are healed. What's, what's going to happen? Jesus is going to show up at the end of the 70th week and they're going to say it was him. We said he was a criminal. We said that he was getting what he deserved. God was punishing him, but he died for us. Amen. He died for our sins. Right. His stripes will heal us. Oh, what's happening? He's finishing the transgression. They're going to finally believe in their Messiah. That, that final, that transgression, that the transgression of rejection will be over. It is then... <clears throat> In Zechariah 12, in Zechariah 12, verse nine, it says, and it shall come to pass in that day. What day? When Jesus shows up and presents himself to the nation of Israel and they accept him and they believe in him. Finally, it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. Watch this, what they're going to say. Watch what they're going to say. The, 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 the people of Israel are going to say this. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. When Jesus shows up on the scene at the end of those 70th week, he's going to present himself as their Messiah and they're going to finally recognize that they've been blinded this whole time and they're going to be grieving because they pierced him. Wow. And God is going to bring an end to their rejection, an end to their unbelief, and they're going to believe in their Messiah and accept him. Say amen. amen. Listen, to finish the transgression, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. That's the second one, right? Yeah. To make an end literally means to seal up or restrain. At the coming of the Lord Jesus to establish his rule on this earth, God will give him the throne of his father, David. We know that in Luke 1, 32 and 33. Okay. During his reign, watch this now. During his reign, he will seal up or restrain sin. Just like a criminal is shut up in a cell. Now we know during that period of time is the millennial reign. That's when the devil's going to be bound and in chains. Somebody say amen. amen. But watch what it says about the nation of Israel. Now keep in mind, we're, we're talking about Israel. We're talking about what God's going to do for Israel. Ezekiel 36, 26. When Jesus comes back at the end of those 70 weeks to finish his transgression, to make an end of sin. It says in Ezekiel 36, 24, I will take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water un, un, upon you and ye shall be clean from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. Amen. Yes, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, he tells the nation of Israel during this period of time when he makes an end of sins. It says, say unto them, thus saith the Lord. This is Ezekiel 37, 21. Say unto them, thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen where they be gone and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king to them. That's King Jesus, by the way. Amen. They shall be no more two nations. Because remember, there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You remember after Solomon's son got real goofy and the, and the kingdom split, he said, there'll be no split kingdoms anymore. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God 
And David, my servant shall be. And by the way, that's Jesus. Amen. It's, King David's already been dead. This is a reference to the son of David, the Messiah, Meshach. Amen. That's Jesus. My servant shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. They all shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Preacher, what are you saying? Finally, the nation of Israel is going to act right. They're going to have a righteous king who has a righteous reign. And who's going to cleanse them and make an end of sin. Somebody say amen. All right. To make reconciliation for iniquity. The, remember, we're going through the six purposes of this 70 weeks <clears throat> to make reconciliation for iniquity. Here, the word reconciliation means atonement or covering. It implies an effective covering for sin, whereby the sinner is reconciled to God. The sins of all men have been atoned for in Christ's death on the cross. Amen. Amen. But although our Lord's death is sufficient for all, it is only effective when men will receive him. It is at this time, Israel is still at right now, as we speak, Israel is still living in rejection of their Messiah so that her atonement awaits the acknowledging of him as their Messiah. And we must remember that this application is for Israel as a nation. Any Jew right now can be saved if they will believe in Christ. There are Messianic Jews. There are Jews that have received Christ as an individual. But as a national group, they have a national rejection. There is the transgression. But in that day, in that day, Christ will atone. He will forgive them and cleanse them because they will finally receive him and believe in him. Amen, church. Quickly, quickly. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. To bring in everlasting righteousness. This will be a new time when Christ will usher in the righteousness of the ages. At this time, Israel will finally be in a right relation to God. And then shall there be righteousness in the earth. Christ's millennial reign on earth will be a kingdom of righteousness. Let me, let me give you a few verses here. Psalms 85, 13. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. This is all talking about every verse I'm reading to you now is talking about the millennial reign. Psalm 97, one and two, the Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitudes of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Isaiah 11, two. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. This is talking about while he's on the throne over this whole earth during his reign on this planet, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And then shall him, they shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with a rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. Can you imagine a politician that's honest <clears throat> and completely righteous? I know, don't I know there's, there's some honest politicians, but not many. Most of the time, they're going to tell you what they think is going to get them elected. But he's going to finally, we're finally going to have on this planet one who does all things well. Every decision will be a righteous decision. Every single step, every single move, every single action will be right. Say amen. amen. To bring in everlasting righteousness. All right. Number five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. Seal up the vision and prophecy. After the 70th week, when Israel worships her Messiah and has been forgiven and cleansed from her sin and has entered into her glory, all prophetic predictions will be fulfilled 
so that faith will give place to sight. All prophecies shall be done with because the purpose of the visions and prophecies will be fully and finally realized. Church, say amen. amen. Lastly, to anoint the most holy. Now, there's a little disagreement on this, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Some people believe that this is talking about a place and some people believe it's talking about a person, but they will both fit. OK, they will both fit. Some people disagree about whether this is a person or place. It is most likely a place to some as in reference to the, the new millennial temple as described in Ezekiel chapter 41. And that's a really cool study too. We may, we may do a series on Wednesday night on the millennial temple that we, we, we read about in Ezekiel. But some believe that it's a great possibility. It's talking about the coronation of Jesus as king when he steps forward to rule this earth. That the, the anointing of the most holy means his presence. You remember, you remember when... Uh, you remember when Solomon built his temple? How many of y'all remember when Solomon? You don't remember, you wasn't there, but you read about it. How many of y'all remember reading about it? All right. You remember what happened at the dedication? You remember what happened at the dedication of the temple? I mean, they're all jacked up. They're all excited and they're singing and they're praising. And they're, the Bible says when their praise and their instruments all became one, that the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I mean, it filled it so full, they had to get out of there. They could not even minister. The priests had to come out of the temple because the glory, the presence of God had filled. See, it was the presence. I know I'm running around, but I got to tell you this. This is so good. The presence of God was what it was that all the world wanted to come see in Israel. You remember the Queen of Sheba? Remember the Queen of Sheba? She done heard about it and heard about it and heard about it and heard about it. She done seen temples, man. She done seen all kind of temples and all kind of elaborate places. She just had to come see the Temple of Solomon. And when she got there, the Bible says it took her breath away. You know why? Because she ain't never seen a temple with a glory cloud in it. Because the Temple of Solomon had the presence of the Shekinah glory of God in that temple. But we know, we know because of Israel's rejection and rebellion that the glory cloud departed. The glory of God, the presence of God departed. And we don't see it coming back until Jesus came back. And, oh, say amen. When he come back and presented himself. But guess what? There's coming a day when that temple is going to be rebuilt and the presence of God is going to fill that place. Whether it's the place or the person, it does not matter. It's all God. And it's going to happen. Those six things, those six things God is going to fulfill. Those six things God is going to accomplish in those 70 weeks. Now, let's talk about the 70 weeks in, 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 in some math. <clears throat> when I walked out of, when I walked out of Westwood High School and drove down Panther Lane, I said, I'm never doing math again. <laughs> Why'd I say that? I said, I was never going to study again too. And God made me be a preacher. Now I got to study every day. Don't ever say you never with God. Say amen. amen. Now let's look at here. Here. You ready? You ready? What was A? What was A? Come on, remind me. Help me. The people of the prophecy. B, the purpose of the prophecy. Those six things. Those six things. Then I want you to see the plan. The plan of the prophecy. This is verse 25 through 27. 70 weeks. <clears throat> 70 weeks. Now, in Hebrew, in Hebrew, where it says 70 weeks are determined. Verse 24. Those two words, 70 and weeks, is Shibiam Shabua. Shibiam Shabua, which means 70 sets of seven. Or, or heptads, if you will. Heptad. What is a heptad? It's a set of seven. So what we are looking at right here, he's saying there's going to be 70 sets of seven. Now we know the word is using weeks here, but it's literally talking about years and not days. 
The word week means heptad or set of seven. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Now, so what are we saying? There's going to be 70, 70 sets of seven. Now, what does that add up to? 490 years. Say that with me. Say it again. All right. And guess what? Guess what? This is, I don't know how this ties in. I have no idea. I've studied, I've studied different Bible scholars and all that, but it just happens to be the same amount of years that they were not captive, but how many years they did not do the Sabbath to cause them to be in the 70 years of captivity. 490 years, they did not keep the Sabbath for the land, right? So God has given them another 490 years to think about. Now, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Y'all ready? All these wonderful accomplishments, all six things will be fulfilled during the 490 years that Gabriel goes on to explain. He divides the seven sevens, 490 years, into three significant periods. And that should be 77s. <clears throat> all right. Uh, that's a, that's a, fix that on there so you don't get your math mixed up. Okay. It's a typo. Into three significant periods, 49 years, that's seven sevens, right? Seven sevens. Then 434 years, that's of, and seven years is the last one. So let's look at this. Look, go back to verse number 25. Know therefore, know that, now what, what is the total number of years that we're looking at? Everybody say it. 490. Now let's look at the division of them. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. Now that's Meshach Nagan, meaning the Messiah, the Prince, Jesus. Okay. Shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, now, this is going to be fun. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Now, he gives the period of time, right? That's cut out, the section, right? It's cut. It's determined. It starts. Do we know when it starts? We know the exact day. We know the exact day that it starts. Look what it says. Verse 25. Know therefore... And understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to. All right. That's when it starts. What day was that? During this period, during this period, this is this is period number one. During this period, the Jews will build the city of Jerusalem in troubled times. The key issue here is the date of the decree. The decree of Daniel 925 is that of Artaxerxes and this Artaxerxes Longimanus in March 14th, 445 BC, authorizing Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and restore the gates. It took 49 years to restore and build Jerusalem and its streets. Now here, everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. There were four edicts or declarations, if you will. For the people of Israel to go back home and build. The first three, the first three all had to do primarily with the temple. With the temple, to go back and build the temple. Only the fourth one had to do with going back and rebuilding everything. The city and the streets. The city and the streets. So by that we know that that was the day. It wasn't the first three. It was the one from Artaxerxes Longimanus who gave them in Nehemiah chapter two. In Nehemiah chapter two, you can go read about that. The day it happened, ex the exact day, March 14th, 445 BC. Now watch, here. look at the division. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, that's March 14th, 445 BC, to build Jerusalem, Unto the build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, uh, uh, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score. And, all right, hold on. Seven weeks, seven weeks or seven. 
heptads, right? Seven sets of seven. What's seven times seven? 49, 49. What's going to happen in 49 years? The street shall be. Okay, this is verse 25. The street shall be. The street will be built and the even in. Go and read Jeremiah. Excuse me, go and read Nehemiah. You'll find out the whole time they were rebuilding, they had fight after fight after fight, trouble after trouble after trouble. They had a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. Say amen. amen. So preacher, what are you saying? He correctly to the day, it took 49 years to restore Jerusalem. For the streets to be built, the city to be built, the walls to be built, in the temple. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. So, okay. That is a fulfillment. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. All right. 49 years. But look what it says. The coming of the Messiah. Now, therefore, understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, that's the beginning. That's the beginning. And unto the Messiah, the prince, that's the end. All right. In other words, at the beginning of the 490 years will be the edict, the, the command to go rebuild the city. That's the beginning. When Jesus comes will be the end of the 49 years. When Jesus presents himself. Are y'all, are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Is everybody with me? Right. Now watch. Three score in two weeks. What's, what's the score? What did we say that was? 20? 20? Times three and plus two, 62, right? 62. So if you take, if you take the seven times seven, which equals 49 and seven times 62 and add them together, you have 483 years, 483 years. Very important. Very important. 483 years. Does that add up to 490? How many are we missing? Seven. Okay. Which would be one heptide. Or, or seven years. Y'all with me? We'll get there. Watch this. Watch this. This is so good. <clears throat> Gabriel affirmed. Gabriel affirmed that 483 years from the time the edict was presented... From the time that Artaxerxes said, go back and rebuild the city, the streets and everything. From that day, March 14th, 445 BC, 483 years from there, he said the anointed one is going to show up. He will present himself. Now watch this. Gabriel affirmed 483 years are involved from the giving of the decree to the coming of the anointed, the one, the ruler. Sir Robert Anderson worked for Scotland Yard in the criminal investigation department. He was a brilliant mathematician and he was consumed with a study of Daniel, especially the 70 weeks prophecy. In his study of the days required in his study, he concluded that 483 years would be 173,880 days. 173,880 days. According to the lunar calendar, see, we, we go off the solar calendar, but they went off the lunar calendar. Okay. We go off the sun. They went off the moon. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Now he counted, he counted from March 14th, 445 BC, 1,000, well, excuse me, 173,880 days, which landed him on April the 6th, 32 AD. This happens to be the 10th of Nisan. The 10th of Nisan was the very day the Jewish people would select a lamb that would be sacrificed on the 14th day of Nisan for Passover. What happened on April 6, 32 AD? It was when Jesus crested the Mount of Olives and told his disciples, go find me a donkey, a colt, and bring him to me. And he presented himself... Boy, I got God bumps a hog goodbye. Say amen. amen. The very day that Jesus presented. Now, what's significant about that? 
What's significant about that? All of Jesus' ministry, all of Jesus' ministry, when he would heal somebody and they'd say, you're the Messiah, what would he always say? Shh. Shh. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Why would he do that? I mean, really, how, how, how are you going to be healed and, 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 and not tell nobody? You know why? Because according to prophecy, it wasn't his time yet. But on this day, this was the very first time, this was the only time he not only, not only did he present himself as the anointed Mishak, the Messiah, when they started criticizing and said, make these people quit praising you, quit saying Hosanna, Hosanna. He said, if they don't, the rocks and trees will cry out. Yeah, that's right. Preacher, what are you saying? What I'm trying to tell you is Daniel gave it to the exact day. The exact day. Now watch, something else happened that day. Brother Travis, something else happened that day. Now we, we shout about the, the, the vision of Jesus on this colt and riding in and they're putting their garments out in the road and the palm branches out in the road and it seems so exciting and such rejoicing. And, but the Bible said when Jesus got close, he overlooked the city. Watch what he said. In Luke 19, it says, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Watch this now. Watch this. Saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, watch this now, watch this, at least in this, thy You know what he's saying? Daniel told you. Daniel told you of this day. The things which belong unto thy peace. But now are they hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee. Thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee. And shall compass thee round about and keep thee on every side. And shall lay thee even unto the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because, watch this now, because thou knewest not the of thy visitation. They should have known that he was the anointed one. Daniel gave him the exact day. Y'all with me say amen? amen? So he said 49 years, seven sevens, 49 years for the rebuilding of the city, for the rebuilding of the streets, for the rebuilding of the wall, and the temple. And it took 49 years. When you add it all together, 483, 483 years went by and Jesus presented himself. But something happened. The transgression. The. The transgression. The rejection. They said we will not have him to rule over us. They said we have no king but Caesar. They said, he's not our king. He came unto his own and his own. They rejected him. It's very important. It's very important. This whole chapter has to do with Israel. Watch this now. Watch this. Look what he says. Look what he says. Let's go back to Daniel 9. To seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. In other words, when the Messiah shows up and presents himself, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. In other words, seven sevens, then 62 sevens. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Now watch what's going to happen. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be what? That means he's crucified. He's killed. What did they do to Jesus when he presented himself as their Messiah? They killed him. They cut him off. But watch this. But not for himself. You see, he didn't die for himself. He died for you. He died for the nation of Israel. Wow. Watch this. The Messiah is killed. Then look what it says. And the people of the prince, here's a, here's a different prince. This ain't the same prince. It's not Jesus. This is talking about the Antichrist. Who are the people of the prince? The Romans. The Antichrist is going to come out of the revived Roman Empire. Out of Middle Europe, Eastern Europe. The people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood under the end of the war. Desolations are determined. That happened in 70 A.D. Daniel predicted it. And it happened in 70 A.D. The Romans came in and, and, and it, we've, we've talked about it. it. They came in like a flood like an overrunning flood that washed away everything. They destroyed everything so bad and so thoroughly. They took and pried up the stones to get the gold out, out of the cracks of the temple. Uh, a writer, a writer, Mark Twain. Mark Twain went and visited Israel and wanted to see what all the hoopla was about Israel and, 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 and this rose in the desert. And he said, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. They left it completely desolate. Desolate. Daniel was right. Or God was right. Now something else happens. Watch this now. That's verse 26, verse 27. And, uh-oh, got a different person here. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's that last seven years, remember? Yeah. Yeah. We only got three, three uh, 483, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we got seven missing. There's one week left, one week of years, one set of seven years. He shall con. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week or one, one heptad, one series of seven. In the midst of the week, in other words, at three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So what's happening here? This is the tribulation period. What's going to happen? Hurry, hurry, I got 34 seconds. Listen, look at me, everybody. This is saying that the Antichrist is going to come forward. The Antichrist is going to come forward. He's going to sign a covenant. He's going to sign a treaty with the nation of Israel. Look at me, everybody. Look at me. Three and a half years in, he's going to break the covenant. Part of the covenant will be the ability of the nation of Israel to rebuild their temple. So in this three and a half years, at the midpoint of the last seven years on this, in this timetable, Israel will have a temple. They will rebuild the temple. But he, the Antichrist, is going to walk in and make them stop their Judean worship, stop the sacrifice and say, I'm God, bow down to me, worship me. That's the abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke about. It is that that Jesus said, when you see this, you run for your lives. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Now I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, preacher. This, this, you know, this ain't adding up. I know in, at the end of verse 26, that's 483 years. 
But then in verse 27, there's another seven years, but, but that hadn't happened. Yes, Jesus presented himself. Yes, they killed him. Yes, they destroyed the temple. 26 is past. 27 is future. What happened? Last point, write this down. We see the parenthesis. There's an interlude. There's a pause. There's a, there's a set period of time. Now I, need you to, I need you to write that down and don't be folding up nothing. Look at me because I'm in the red. And I was like way in the red Sunday because y'all didn't listen fast enough. <laughs> now look at me, everybody. Look at me, everybody. This is everything I said at the beginning is going to make sense right here. Why is there an interlude? Why is there a break in the action between verse 26, when Jesus was crucified, the city was destroyed by Titus in, in 70 AD until the last seven years? When will that begin? When will that the, the last seven years will will begin at the signing of the treaty with the Antichrist in Israel? That hasn't happened yet. That's future. Jesus said, when you see that run, right? So why doesn't, why doesn't Daniel talk about the interlude? Why doesn't Daniel talk about the break? (laughs) He's dealing with the Jews. The interlude is the church. Y'all with me? Well, why didn't Daniel talk about it? Because the Bible says, according to the Apostle Paul, none of the Old Testament prophets knew anything about the church. It was a mystery. I'm out of time. Go home. Listen, here's your homework. Yeah, y'all go home. If I got to do math today, you can do homework. Look, look. Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3, it's, it's, it's right down there. Ephesians 3, 1 through 11. Just highlight it or circle it. Here's, here's what, look, at, look at me, everybody. This is where Paul explains about the interlude. He said, look, nowhere do you find the church in the New, Old Testament. I mean, you, you see people trying to compare or claim verses for the church. It's not there. Paul said it would not be there because God hid it from all the Old Testament saints. Even, watch this now, even the apostles. He revealed it to Paul. It was a mystery. You remember what we said? This whole chapter has to do with what people? Israel. Israel. That's why Daniel didn't say nothing about it between verse 26 and 27 because that's Israel. That's all about Israel. Those 490 years was all about Israel. The church period has nothing to do with Israel. They have been set aside temporarily. Now, don't go into this false teaching. There's 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 false teaching in saying that the church replaced Israel. That is not true. That is heresy. That is false doctrine. God is not through with Israel. They are still the apple of his eye. They are still his people. He has got them in time out. But when that time's up, he's going to restore them. But right now we're in the interlude. We're in the parenthesis. We are in the time between chapter 26 and 27 in the age of the church. Say, when, when does that interlude end? When the church is gone. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together to be with them in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. In that moment, the antichrist is going to step forward. He's going to explain everything and sign the treaty. Seven years. <laughs> 